Mark Scott and Alan Hahn, and then that leads right into us, and then Carlin after that, and Bart Scott joins us now, right here at the Q. I appreciate it, man. What's up, man? It. This is my hood, too. I'm, I'm usually around at the W. Really? Getting my massages. No happy endings included. None. But, you know, right around the corner. They shut it down, man. Really? They shut it down. Because of your business or lack thereof or what's going on? Or because of what you weren't I wasn't, getting. I wasn't a great tipper. Really? Yeah. Oh, Bart. That's wow. terrible. How were the massages there, though? Depends on who you get. It was excellent. Because I know fancy people like you, when they oh, want a massage, oh, man. they don't go to some little joint. They go to a fancy hotel. Well, I need somebody that can get in there. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? Like Orchids of Asia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Not that deep. <laughs> I, prefer, I, I don't want them to get in that deep, man. It's just surface level. You know, get just a little, <laughs> little below the tissue. All right, with Bart, we're going to start the big game preview. Brought to you by Two by London, the engagement shop at London Jewelers. So I heard your show today, and yeah. you think it's going to be the 49ers. So... Tell me how the 49ers win. No, no, I didn't think. Oh the no, 49ers. I'm sorry. The, the, the Chiefs. That's my yeah. bad. I'm sorry. Well, well, the it, it, listen. This is a pick 'em game. You can you can throw this game up. And, it, it, and what I love is about the Super Bowl. How intriguing the matchups are. Is you never really know who's going to come out with that game plan. That first 15 script that's going to kind of get their team going. And it's about who can handle the emotions, the, the the moment. And I just think that Kansas City has more room for error. Because they can win defensively. Maybe I think their defense is underappreciated for what they've been able to do for the last 10 weeks. And I just believe that Mahomes and Andy Reid is just their moment. And I think maybe San Francisco is just early to the party. But I thought that this, I felt the same way about Seattle. When Seattle went and they played the best offense of the year, which was Peyton Manning here in, 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 um, you know, in New York. And they came out and proved me wrong. So... I just I'm conflicted. I can you can you can flip a coin, but if I had to be pressured to take a take an opponent, I mean or, or take a take a team, I'm going to say that the Kansas City Chiefs could win and could win convincingly. I think the, the Super Bowls that had uh, the defense putting pressure on the quarterback, yeah. the defense always did well. As you mentioned, Seattle against uh, Peyton, the Giants against Brady. But I think the big difference is that Mahomes could beat you with his legs. Yes. As a former linebacker, what do you do to try to contain him? Is it possible to contain him? Well, the thing about uh, the 49ers is they, they rush four. So when you rush four, even in a, just a traditional formation, it's five gaps. So Mahomes is good at being able to identify those gaps. And the same windows that he throw through, he also runs through. But now he's not as fast as some of the other mobile quarterbacks that San Francisco struggled with. But if I'm San Francisco, I'm saying, you know what? I'm going to dictate to you where you can escape. And you think about, you know, these tackles. They, they, they got to be, you know, fearful of the fact that Ford and Bosa can beat you around the edge. So they're going to get off on the ball really fast and kick, and kick slide really fast. It's going to create an opportunity for them to come underneath. Now, what makes them different than what potentially what uh, Tennessee was trying to do when Mahomes had the big run to, to up the sideline is they have defensive tackles that aren't just your Casey Hampton, Sarah Goose of fat guys. These are guys that can run Mahomes down. So I would try and dictate that, okay, Mahomes, I'm going to make you roll to your left, which he does well because of the baseball. He's able to square his shoulders and throw across his body, which is usually a no-no for most quarterbacks. But I'm going to say, you know what, I have a better chance of making you run and escape to your left and I'm going to set these traps. And when I get you, especially early, it's important for, for the 49ers to make sure that they hit them and they hit them often. What we used to try and do when we face a quarterback that we feared, we wanted to get body blows early in the game. But also, you want, you know, usually when you're, you know, going to make a tackle, we, we're taught to kind of bring it from the hip and shoot from your hip like you're an old, a old Western and you're in a gunfight. Against guys like Mahomes, you want to try and come really wide and tackle his arms. You're probably saying, why would I want to tackle his arms? Well, if you tackle his arms, when he falls down, he can't protect his face. So what you try and do early on, you tackle his arms, make him hit his head a couple times, hope that you can pin his arms against him and hope you can put some damage on that shoulder. We remember Saragusa against Rich Gannon. Mm. Now, I'm not saying hurt anybody, but it's about establishing blows. You want to land some, some really good body shots early so that he can have hesitation about leaving that safety net that he has. Because when he leaves the pocket, he then becomes a runner. And he doesn't have the same protections as uh, a traditional quarterback in the pocket. Now, just from a... This, a, a Super Bowl standpoint, style of play. Yeah. Do you, do you see this going the way all Super Bowls seem to go, where the first quarter is awkward, and sometimes we don't really get into what feels like a football game until 10 minutes left in the second quarter? You know, it depends on who gets the ball first, and that'll be interesting. If, if Kansas City 
gets the ball, will, do they want to defer and, and, and figure it out? Or do they want to say, you know, our offense is the strength of our team. Andy Reid has a tremendous record when he has two weeks coming off a of bye week, which is pretty much what this Super Bowl is. He probably has a great 15-play script that can get his team in a rhythm. And against a team like San Francisco, you don't want to be having to play from behind because of this tremendous run game is how they get their explosive plays. So, I mean, I can see it moving fast depending on who gets the ball first. Trick plays are, are in. You know, I think the key of this game is, you know, can this defense contain Mahomes and can they can Jimmy G, if asked to, drop back traditionally and, 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 and serve you up and will it be death by a thousand paper cuts? Now, um, Jimmy Johnson, newly elected into the Hall of Fame, did a guest column in the Post that I was shocked. He said that Patrick Mahomes is the greatest quarterback he's ever seen. Oh, now, you faced a lot of great quarterbacks. Is this guy in that level? No, prisoner of the moment, right? We, we say that about everybody. Just last year, we were saying that about golf. Before that, we said it about Russell Wilson. Remember the first golden, golden child, um, at least this era, was Aaron Rodgers. He's been back. He's been to the Super Bowl once, won a Super Bowl, but he hasn't been back then. Right. I think this is the best team that Mahomes will ever have, especially if he take forty million dollars. Then we'll be able to evaluate if he's the best that we've seen, because right now, because he's cheap, he probably arguably has the best weapons. He has a he he has a he has an Olympic sprinting team on his on his roster right now, and when he takes that money, he's definitely going to lose Sammy Watkins. They got to try and sign Chris Jones. Right now, he can go out and get higher guns because they they picked right. They got a quarterback that's young and cheap. We see the two teams in this town trying to do the same thing and use that type of strategy. But is he the best I've seen? No, uh, not at all. I don't think he's the best that we've seen. I don't even know if he's the best in the league right now. Who's the now. best you've seen? I mean, the best I've seen is, to me, is Tom Brady. Um, no, but no quarterback put more mental stress on me than Peyton Manning. It was different going against Peyton Manning opposed to Tom Brady. Tom Brady's all about execution. Peyton Manning did all the little things, right? Keep you in your stance for, for two minutes, you know, go up to the line, create pressure on you. You would try and steal some of his Omaha or yellow, what that meant. But he had his team so prepared that yellow meant something in the first quarter, but meant something totally different right. in the second quarter. So he would use your football acumen against you. So in that terms, instead of just going on and, and, and trying to beat the man across from you like you did when you went against Brady, Peyton had you thinking. And when you think, you move slow. You can't react. So things that you would normally see, you don't see. Does it surprise you that, like, experts, not, not just non-football players, football yeah. players too, are, are going this far with the Mahomes thing? Because yeah. don't, don't get me wrong. I, I'm excited to see him. And I, I, I made this comparison on the air, and I think a lot yeah. of people have done this. Patrick Mahomes in football, to me, is Steph Curry in basketball. He's not the greatest player of all time, but he plays the game in a different way than we've seen before. So when you see it, you're... You marvel at it. But I can't believe the level of experts that have already coronated him the best in the game. Pr prisoners of the moment, right? I mean, because I think right now, if you take Deshaun Watson and you put him on that same roster, you get the same productivity, right? I think right now, you just... And go back to my Aaron Rodgers analogy, right? Remember who Aaron Rodgers had when he w was the baddest man on the planet, right? He had Donald Driver. He had Jordy Nelson. He had Jennings. He had uh, Jones. And I think I forget the tight end that he had, but he had like a, a, a Finley. Michael Finley. Jermichael yeah. Finley. Jermichael Michael Finley. I mean, like, you, you take those guys right there. He has pretty much oh. the same thing that Mahomes had, right? And, and, and he was only able to get to one because you're going to start to lose those pieces, right? And, and what happens when you lose those pieces where people try and break down guys that are the, the it guys right now, they start taking your coaching staff, which they've already started to do, and then they start taking some of your free agents, which people are going to come after Chris Jones, Tyron Matthews, how long can he play? And eventually Sammy Watkins is going to be gone, and, you know, then he's going, then we're going to see what he well, really is. That's why I believe in Russell Wilson, right? Because Russell Wilson won with the Legion of Boom, but now he's... No, the team's reset, and they're right, still great right, under and Russell Wilson. And they're Wilson. still right there. So, I mean, I'm not ready to put Patrick Mahomes above Russell Wilson right now, let alone some of the but, other guys I think are dynamic. Well, we can have a conversation five, six years from now talking about that he is clearly the we best. We could. We're still talking about a young kid. Granted, he's got a ton of talent, but most great yeah. quarterbacks outside of maybe Tom Brady have had great talent around him. But he's on the fast track to be that. People are rushing him that way. But, yeah. Bart, you have to admit that he's on his way to being that. He wins the Super Bowl okay. on Sunday. Two, three more years he's of this type that. of level, he, uh, he's going to surpass everybody. I mean, can Action Jack 
Jackson take the next step next year when they get him more weapons? Could you imagine if Action Jackson had the same type of weapons he had? Could you imagine if Deshaun Watson had the offensive line and Bill O'Brien not being his coach or general manager, what that team would look like as well? But will they? I there's, mean, been a, there's been a lot of great players in this league that never became great because of the team they were stuck on. I mean, maybe Archie Manning would have been Terry Brad, Bradshaw, but yeah. he was stuck in New Orleans and couldn't be that. But, so we'll see. Yeah. But I'm telling you, man, I think I still don't think he's better than Russell Wilson right now. I think we're prisoners of the moment. What happens is if he wins the Super Bowl, if he doesn't win the Super Bowl, defensive coordinators will break this system down. And it's going to be a lot harder next year to have the same productivity. Perfect storm right now. This is your moment. That's why you have to capitalize on this moment. Remember yeah. Dan Marino, yeah. right? Dan Marino had a message for Mahomes. Win now. Because there's no guarantees that you're going to get back to this game. I mean, I'm sure Aaron Rodgers, when he won the Super Bowl, thought that he was going to be, uh, you know, be back over and over again. That's what makes what Tom Brady and the Patriots did so special. Because with the expectations, with changing teams, with guys going to get paid somewhere else, with, you know, failed free agents, they still managed to get six. I was talking with Bart Scott. Can you hang a little bit? I got no life. Hey, Don LeGreco, Peter Rosenberg, coming to you from the House of Q here in Hoboken. Our special guest, our colleague is former Jet and Raven, Bart Scott. I was thinking about this because I heard you guys talking and joking around with Chris Canty. Everybody thinks, uh, everybody in sports wants to make money. Yeah. But just being around baseball players for over 30 some odd years, I'll tell you what. Superseding money is a championship. I think right. everybody wants. How much of a hold did that leave that you didn't play for one? It's tough. It's like it's like I was good luck Chuck, right? I went to three consecutive AFC championships, and I probably have more road wins probably than most people that even played in the league. I, I got at least eight road wins because I was always the sixth seed. And it, if I could do it all over again, I wouldn't chase the money. I didn't chase the money because I gave up money. Um, but I would have chased a, a, a franchise quarterback. Yeah, you know, I tell a lot of these young guys, when, you, when, you, when you're able to add a Super Bowl on your resume, that type of, you know, pelt on your belt, you know, it makes everything right with the world. It's like I, it's like I died an athlete's death, and it's like my spirit can't rest because I watch a lot of bums walking around with Super Bowl <laughs> rings that couldn't play dead in the country western. And it's like one of those things. It's like I'm just as deserving. And I put it on the line. I paid the price just like everybody else. But sometimes it's just about timing. You know, and my window was there for a while. And we just wasn't able to close the deal. And, you know, that's that's one of the regrets because that's when you start going back and saying, what could I have done better to get there? I mean, I'm sure Carl, I'm not putting myself in the same vein as uh, or the same lane as Carl Malone, uh, you know, Gary Payton. Gary Payton, all those other players that paid the price. Barkley. It just sometimes it's just it's just right place, right time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, the, the, one of my teammates that we cut because, you know, Rex Rex was like, oh, listen, man, you're kind of big, big, big how you're kind of fat, all right? All right, so when you go to break, I need you to lose 12 pounds. I need, I need you to lose some weight. He came back, gained 12 pounds. Rex cut him. He went to Green Bay, won the Super Bowl. Right place, right time. Yeah. You know, and it's like one of those things. So, like, my soul is, like, unrested, and it can't, it can't properly go because... I didn't get the championship. So, you know, what I'm trying to do now, I uh, co coach my son's kids, you know, and I'm, I'm blitzing the hell out of 12-year-olds. Nice. I'm trying, to get, I'm trying to get a victory anywhere I can. That, that must be hard, though, because, like, I mean, you look at you physically, and you look like you can still go out and play right now. Yeah, and, that's, that's and, by design. And, I, and, and I'm sure it is. And, I, you know, I was saying this on the show this week about Kobe. I saw Kobe at the Staples Center a month ago. Right. And all I kept thinking was, I know how he looked at the end of his career, and it right. wasn't the same guy. Right. But I'm watching him sitting here right now, and I'm like, this guy, he should go play in Ice Cubes League. Like, he could <laughs> yeah. dominate pl basketball right now. It must be so hard to be so young in life. Yeah. And have this 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 thing that you didn't get. Yeah, I was 32, and it, and what happens is that transition, man. I had to go start doing a lot of therapy because you, your body still wants to play, but you know you can't compete potentially at that level because everybody's getting faster, stronger, and they're younger than you. And also, by the way, you're a veteran, you cost more than anybody else. And it's like you know what Frank Gore is doing. I wasn't willing to do. I wasn't willing to be a hired gun to go from team to team to team. Frank, do, Gore's do you have any regrets about that? I do, because um, it was one of those things, like, what are you willing to sacrifice? And I kind of mentioned, like, how I paid the price to be good, not great. You know, because it's selfish. It's a selfish act to try and, you know, pursue greatness. Because you have to shut everything else out. And, and, and you being great has to be the primary goal. So, you know, you got to go work out by yourself. You can't really spend as much time with your kids as you want. You miss out on all those moments. And when I, when I got released from the Jets because I had reconstructive toe surgery, you know, the Seattle Seahawks and the Kansas City Chiefs wanted me to come play. But I had, my son was born, you know, July 1st. 
And it was like one of those things. Am I going to leave my family, go move right. halfway across the country, uproot them from school, and then you start asking yourself, am I being selfish? Right? Because for you to be great, everybody has to try and cater to you so that you can live your dream. And the question that most players have to ask themselves, are you willing, is it time for you to start supporting their dreams, right? Because we all get here because everybody, you know, does things for us, whether it's your mom taking you to practice, sacrificing her money so you can have personal trainers, whether it's the dad like Alan who's driving all the way uptown to keep, take you on traveling uh, hockey and all those things. And I just feel like that would be selfish of myself. Right. And I was comfortable <laughs> with, with how my career had went, and Seattle just happened to win the Super Bowl that year. So, yeah, <laughs> great call by me. But... It's interesting because we were talking about it the other day, the comment that you made yeah. about being good you know, to great and the sacrifices you have had to make to be great. Does it bother you that the narrative around sports and talk radio is, well, you know, Bart, if you were a little bit more dedicated, maybe you would be in the Hall of Fame. If you cared a little bit more, maybe you would have won that Super Bowl. I mean, how unfair is that? I mean, you decided to have a family earlier. Yeah. You know, so you're going to be able to see your kids grow a lot older than, than I'm going to be having yeah. a kid at 49. Yeah. But does it bother you that the narrative says, yeah. you know what, Tom Brady cared more because he made sacrifices that maybe you weren't willing to make. And, and that puts you in a poor light in well, that kind of context. Well, that wasn't the case for, for me, and, and I, I can live with that, but because... That just because I wasn't selfish doesn't mean I didn't put the work in. Well, I, put, no, I, I, I put the work in, but I wasn't willing to go to Arizona to, to, to go train at altitude with other other great guys. What I had to do is if I went somewhere and went on vacation, I would have to pay my trainers to fly with me. But I wasn't able to, to, to be at the best places that I needed to be. Right. It's like one of those right. things. A hundred yards is a hundred yards. And I had to you know make do with what I had, you know, what I had available to me where I was located, because it was important for me to make sure that when my kids had a play or my kids had a, you know, a field trip that their dad was there because... Well, yeah, I'm absolutely. And, and I, I know you put in the work. I've worked yeah. with you. I've seen it. But, like, to the coaching aspect, we were, at, we were talking to Adam Gase. He's missing Thanksgiving with his family because he's preparing for the game yeah. on Sunday. I don't think he likes his family. But, but, but that's possible. But That's you know the perception is the whole right. Jimmy Johnson, you have to put football first above yeah. God, above family, if you're going to win. Yeah. Tony Dungy bucked that trend. Right. But for the most part, in the perception of the fans is, is the guys that make the sacrifices. But it's, but, they're the but, but, ones but, uh, that should be exalted for pure greatness. And, 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 and I know what you're saying, Don. That, right. is, that is unfair because it's all happenstance. Yeah. If, if Bart ends up on Seattle instead of the yeah. Jets, he's right. a Super Bowl champion. And so, yeah. I mean, or like, Schottenheimer listen, runs the damn ball. I get to the Super Bowl. <laughs> we'll take care of it. We get, just run the ball four straight times. You got a 260-pound tailback. you trying to be cute so you get a head coaching job, but you mad because Rex got the coaching job. And you interview for ah, this is so where now it comes you, out. So now you're trying to be a great coordinator, <laughs> just like Kyle Shanahan did when Julio catches the ball, run the ball two times, kick the damn field goal, but you're trying to show everybody how smart you is, and then you, you sacrifice my championship. <laughs> I can't wow. die happy. I wish you would just tell us how you feel. I can't wow. die happy. I know. At least you're over it, though. We're going to break down this game further. I'm in the face. I see him in the street. We're going to lead right into Rex Ryan. So when we come back, we're going to ask Bart exactly some secrets about Rex that we could throw at him. Some of them we know. Uh, this portion of the Michael K. Show on 9870 ESPN is brought to you by the New Jersey Lottery. With a $155 million Mega Millions jackpot win, you could fly your entire family to a villa in the south of France and throw in a separate chateau for the in-laws. Take a chance on Mega Millions. After all, anything can happen in Jersey. Did Rex go to the hospital when you had your toe surgery? You know what? No, he, he told me uh, two weeks later that he had, to, he had to let me go. Oh, wow. So I'm just playing. Isaac was the one who fired me. I wanted to talk about, listen, I wanted to beat the hell out of, uh, out of John Isaac. First of all, he didn't even bring me in. Like, the general manager coming after you played with a torn ligament for a whole year. For, for 13 weeks, I played with a torn ligament. And the general manager that just got hired is the one who fired me. I want to smack the taste out of his mouth. That's another one on the smack list. All right. We got a smack I list. I love your you, you guys should really yeah. relate it. Michael's is in a smack list. I, I have a laminated list. He has a laminated okay. list. People that I will get. Of people right. that, he will people get. that have done me wrong that yeah. I will get back. Smack somehow. list sounds good. Well, we, we don't want you to hurt those brittle hands, man. If you need somebody to, to bring that smoke, I you, got you. You guys could combine your smack yeah, list and the yeah. laminated list. Yeah. What's, that, what's that movie, My Name's Earl, when he had to go back and write the wrong yes. song? Yeah. So I got a hit list for all the people that wronged me. I'm going to smack the hell out of them. 
down. Jason Lee? And I'll bring him down somehow. No, I, don't, I don't think I'm, I'm too old to smack. Well, give him a little Van Gundy on there. Hold, hold the ankle while uh -huh. I hit him with the Ric Flair chop. Kayla, Gregor, Rosenberg, Scott, and you are right here on uh, Bart Scott's been so great hanging with us. You can hear him every single day. We're so happy with our new show. We're proud of the new show on our station. Alan Hahn, Bart Scott from 1 to 3, and boom, right into us. And he's nice enough to join us here in Hoboken at the House of Q. So you think the 49ers will lose and the Chiefs will win. If the 49ers win, what happened? Kansas City, even though they shut down Derrick Henry, won't be able to handle this complex running game. Me and Rex always used to have this thing when we ever we went against teams that shift in motion. Like you think about San Francisco, they shift their motion 79% of their snaps. Okay. Right? All that is to do is to grab the eyes of the defenders as they run simple runs, right? All this ghost reverse, motion shifts, and all that stuff. And we used to have this thing that whenever teams did that to us, we would just sit back and say, You so crazy, <laughs> right? Because, you know, once you dress that down, Right. And see what it really is, it's easy to stop. Now, the question is, can Spagnola create a defense that's balanced on both sides? Where, because it, the running backs in this, on, this, on, on San Francisco are average. But it's the system. Just like when you think about Mike Shanahan, his dad, you think about Terrell Davis. Yeah, he's in the Hall of Fame. But you think about Mike Anderson. You think about uh, Gary, some of the other guys that came behind that system. They were able to put up 1,000 yards. So now when you see a guy like Mostert or somebody like Breida, guys that have been cut six times, there's a reason why they were cut six times, because they can only play in certain type of systems. They weren't elite running backs. So if, if Spagnola is able to be able to set the edge, have balance, because when I think about most of their big plays, especially when you think about the trap play that they were able to get on third and eight that went for 30 yards, they're all open side runs. Why is it? Why, why am I talking about open side runs and open side defense? It's because they set the defense with the formation, and it's either pre or post snap where they change the math. It's all about math because what happens is they'll set the defense to one side. You overshift. You have a linebacker with bad eyes that see everybody go this way they go this way they don't see the guys pulling or the guy coming in the ghost reverse that oh in turn becomes the lead blocker so you don't have to be a big guy because they're going to cut whoever's there left you just run out of guys and you end up one short so if you go balanced and say okay we're balanced on both sides we may give up more rushing yards but we're not going to give up the big explosive plays so if you get jimmy g and that offense behind the sticks mm -hmm. can jimmy g then pick up third and seven consecutively can he pick up uh, second and six. Do you look at a guy like Spagnuolo as a good defensive coordinator? Well, I, I thought he was until I talked to one of his former players and said he... <laughs> I talked to one of his former players and he said like some of his principles are just not fundamentally sound. Okay. Now, can Kyle Shanahan exploit that? I don't know. But he, he, he kind of gambles and hedges his bet on certain defenses where it's voided zones, where it's not even fundamentally sound. But can Jimmy G find it? Because if Jimmy G can't come off a of play action and get in a rhythm, is he able to throw people open? See, it's one thing when you, you, you're running the ball and you're averaging five yards a carry and the linebackers are coming up. We saw Nick Foles do that, right? But if you shut that down and those linebackers are, are maintaining their depth and closing those windows, can he be what people say a window thrower? Right. right? Can he can he throw dimes like Trent Dilfer says? I don't know. I haven't seen him do it. I saw him against Minnesota and he looked suspect. And I don't I don't have the exact stat, but I heard somebody on, on this on radio say that he's like third or fourth most turnovers behind uh, Winston and other guys. That's five dollars. Is that me? No, no, I don't have my phone. Okay. Now I have a question for you. Sure. At what point, being a football player? Two questions. Yeah. One, how many of your colleagues can legitimately talk football the way you do? Like have this level of an understanding of it? And at what point does it go from you're playing the game, you listen to coaches, to this ridiculous? I mean, honestly, it's like listening to a mix of art and math. Listening to you talk about plays. When does it become that? I mean, I was just fortunate enough to be around some of the greatest defensive minds. Rex Ryan was one of them. Mike Nolan. Uh, uh, you think about, uh, who's my guy? I can't think of him right now. Blame to CTE. Um, <laughs> Chuck, oh, Chuck, Chuck Pagano. Chuck Pagano. Okay, yeah. You're also around some of the Dennis Thurman. 
And what happens, the, the strength was our complexity, right? Because we understood what offenses were being taught, so we knew where the ball was going. So we're able to play a certain way. When I talk to most guys, and even in this business, when I talk to most former athletes, they're dumb as a box of rocks. Like, they, like they can't articulate this because they don't see the game this way, right? So was there one? But what's better to be? Is it, is it better to be super unbelievably athletic, talented, or really smart? The game is 80% mental, right? Because we, we're all big and fast. See, so what happens is, and I always use this quote all the time, is from Bernard. Hopkins and he says what what is built lasts longer than what's born so at some point we all hit the apex of how great we're going to be athletically right so then what you can lean on is your fundamentals that's why a guy like Philip Rivers fell right off the cliff right because he always had bad mechanics and what happens is when you don't have that super strong arm can you can you fundamentally figure out ways to still have a fastball right. even though physically you can't throw it so you I see that same thing with Brady that's why Brady's yeah. been able to stay at the top for so long because you hear about the work that he does as far as being fundamentally sound making sure that he's not wasting motion and things of that sort right so like you know it's a, it's a lot of guys out there that just don't have the discipline to be disciplined right because as you get older it gets harder you know what I mean? So and the homework. I mean, it's, it's real, it sounds like real homework. You don't figure this out. I'm guessing you didn't show up to college and understand the game the way you do now. Not at all. That requires sitting and learning. And, be, and also being around great players, right? Mike Singletary is my linebacker coach. I played with Ray Lewis. Was he good? But, but was he really good at linebacker? He was really good at <laughs> motivating. He, he might be the dumbest football player. <laughs> Singletary? Uh, Mike Singletary only understood. Oh, man, Mike was, man, Mike was tough, man. <laughs> it was, it, Mike, Mike was tough, man. It, I mean, if, if we were teaching the Bears defense, he's, he's a genius. You teach anything else, just something similar like cover right. two, it's hard, man. It's hard to listen well, to Mike, man. Mike. <laughs> but, but to your point about, Mike. <laughs> about the smart, really, what team has won a championship? That's an inside that, shot, too. <laughs> that overcame bad coaching. Say it again. I said, what team has won a championship that overcame bad coaching? Like, they could be physically talented and just were so much better than the opposition, they were able to survive having a coach that didn't know what they were doing. That, that rarely happens. Yeah, I mean, so it has to be game planning and the mental aspect of it more. Because uh, right now, especially with a salary cap, you can't be that much more talented than everybody else. Well, sometimes sometimes you got to overcome your coaching. But that's why, you but know. They don't, but they don't win. Yeah, how Harry many, Switzer. How many dud no, coaches? It was Switzer already made for him. But, but right, Switzer right. was smart not to touch Jimmy Johnson. If, if Barry Switzer came before Jimmy, I think he would have gotten exposed. But how many dud coaches have won the Super Bowl. When you look at the list of winning, there are a couple. Yeah. But for the most part, those are all guys who had right. great careers. And, and, and that's what you have in this matchup. You have guys, you know, Salah is a guy that's up and coming. He, he has these guys doing something very well. Um, and he it wasn't broke, so he didn't try and fix it, right? He brought the Seattle type of, uh, and Rex would tell you that that's just our sting package that they probably stole from him. You know, I think Rex doesn't get enough credit for what he's, you know, given to this game. You know, because for years, I remember watching him and Dick LeBeau steal stuff from each other, right? And if something works there, then the next week you look up and, and Pittsburgh is running it. And I think he's responsible for a lot of these great defensive concepts that people, you know, use in the league. And it's unfortunate to me that he's not out there, you know, coaching. For Are you surprised that it's two years that he's not coaching? And he pretty much said on the air last week, he said, I know I'm never going to get another job. Well, he would have to do what, what, what Pete Carroll did. He would have to go back to college, reinvent himself, show that he can reconnect with the modern day athlete. Rex's problem has always been that he loves too hard and he, and he trusts people too much right he, he trusts people to have the same passion for the game and have his back like he had them and sometimes he hired some guys that I felt like really didn't um, have his back and he trusts them too much but he's an excellent coach and I think some of the false narratives out there is that we didn't have discipline you don't run the type of defense that we ran you don't have the type of success that we've had in an organization that hasn't had success if you don't have a guy that holds his guys accountable I mean if I gave you okay I put like this right I'm working on an app and I don't tell you what the app is but I'm working on a football thing and Rex sent me all of our all of his uh all of his intellectual property so to speak right 300,000 files wow that's what we would, would have to learn and I can I can tell you you can get 80 percent or probably 40 I pray you can probably get 70 percent of his players and they can be able to digest it and they can teach it no it's not surprising to me that Anthony Weaver is a new defensive coordinator for the Houston Texans Rex Ryan taught so he's him. a legitimate defensive genius that wasn't overblown no he, he is like he's like rain man dude but really him Dick LeBeau Wade Phillips you know like they're like the cream of the cream man and Steve Young 
has come on the show many times and said the problem with Rex is he just he was so much on the defensive side that it ate quarterbacks up. That quarterbacks couldn't grow with Rex as the head coach. It was the same thing with his dad. Great defensive coordinator, but in a quarterback's league, he just wasn't the right head coach to grow a quarterback. I, I, I would push back on that because Rex really wasn't over there because at that point he had Dennis Thurman, he had Mike Pettin, guys that he trusts with, it, with, with his system. I think what he did is he trusted them too much, right? He allowed them to do it. Instead of saying, hey, man, run the ball, throw the ball, he said, I hired you to do a job. I'm going to let you do your job, and I'm not going to micromanage when I feel like he should have stepped in and probably held guys more accountable because at the end of the day, they didn't have his best interest at heart. When he got Schottenheimer, Schottenheimer was somebody that was held over because he was a young coach. Rex was a first-time coach, so he had to, you know, he was given some of his assistance. He didn't go out and be able to pick the people that he would want. And it's crazy to think about it now, though, to even act as if Rex wasn't a success. Think about what the team was under Rex Ryan. Yeah. Think about where they've been since. He's the most successful head coach in two decades. Should you have won either of those two championship games? We really should have. We really should have. Um, you know, I think about the Pittsburgh when we came out flat. We, we fell into a big hole. Now, how, how can you come out flat in an AFC championship game? We were beat up, man. We had just played two tough games. Okay. You know, you know they, they're coming off a bye, so they're fresh. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're on the road, traveling, airplane, you know, emotionally spent. And, and, and we, we, just, we just came out, and, we, and they had more juice than us. And they had the crowd, and what happened is, remember that third and 18, you know, we had put in a, and that's kind of when we outsmarted ourselves, because we had Jason Taylor playing middle linebacker. We had this special package, and we had everybody covered just like we wanted, and Ben scrambled for 18. The only reason you scramble for 18 is because you have no linebackers on the field. Mm -hmm. You had Jason Taylor, like a great player, Hall of Fame player, but a fish out of water when you stand him up in the middle and say, hey, read these concepts. And, 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 and it kind of went downhill from there and took us a while to kind of scramble back. I was at that game. The atmosphere was just unbelievable yeah. in Pittsburgh. I really believed if you could have stopped him on that third down, and they yeah. threw. They threw to Brown. And he pat, and, pat, pat. Right. And if he drops the ball, throws it incomplete, you, you're, you're, they got a they punt. Yeah, we had him on their heels. And I really believed in my heart that you would have scored had you gotten the ball yeah. back. Did you feel the same way? I did. And, 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 and we had a, a, a blitz that was a, a safe blitz, but Ben, 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 right? And that's what's so scary about Mahomes because you can, do, you can dial up the right stuff. But because he can fade away, fade away, and still have the arm strength to be accurate, you know, that's what Ben did. He just bought time, bought time, bought time, and eventually the great players are able to find holes in zones. And there's one of those things where it's like woulda, shoulda, coulda. We're know? talking with Bart Scott here on the Michael K. Show. Do you believe that the 49ers have stopped throwing because their running game is so great or because they got spooked by the interception that Jimmy G threw against Minnesota? No, no, I, I think they, they, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? Because it's Can easy. he throw, though? I think he can, but he's he's like Kirk Cousins. He's like Matt Schaub. He's a guy that has to throw off rhythm, and he's a guy that can make throws, but I don't trust him consistently throwing outside the numbers. I think he's a guy that, you know, when I, whenever we put, went against a, like a Kubiak team or we went against a Mike Shanahan team, we understood that we can set edges from our inside tackles. And you're saying, well, what does that mean, set edges? Because they're running sideways, you can push them back from the inside, but that, that stops them from being able to get outside. So it's not about the guy on the outside all the time. Sometimes it's about the guys on the inside just firing off and getting up the field, which may, makes the runner either have to bounce out or cut it up. And he does that. That gives your linebackers an opportunity to scrape and be free hitters. Now, now does... Now, the problem is, does Kansas City have the linebackers that can, that can really punish some of these running backs? Because, yeah, I know they got three of them, but you can knock three running backs out. Trust me, I've seen it done before. When, when you're watching a football game, yeah. can you watch it as a fan or are you analyzing it as an expert in I'm your wa head? I'm watching it like a chess match. You are. So I'm seeing the movie. So you're different than what we're watching. Yeah, yeah, because I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm seeing exactly what Kyle is saying. So when Kyle does the ghost motion and you don't respond to it, I know later on he's going to come to that. Right, so I know that I see I see the setup coming, and I'm just trying to see if the other defense coordinator sees the setup and understands that. Okay, first time he, he's just going to run it; it's not going to be anything. Second time is he may not run it. The third time he's going to check, and it's going to be a big play. And what he's going to go to in a big moment is going to be something that you haven't seen, but it's going to be off the same exact look. How you, could Richard Sherman keep up with that speed that the, uh, the Chiefs have? He can't, but the thing is, he's going to press bell, right? He's going to set up and act like he's press belling. And the whole argument between him and Revis is the fact that Revis is saying, no matter what, I'm playing every route. 
when you play on top cover three man pretty much what you're saying is I'm playing a deep route because if the guy runs 15 yards and runs a press out then that's your cur that's your curl flat guy that's supposed to undercut that so if I know that I only get, have to not give up the big route I stay on top that's why you see Shermer getting these these interceptions where the receiver is behind him and the, and the quarterback just throws it up and it looks like he's the intended receiver because he's only playing one route and what he's doing is because he knows he's playing deep he's reading the, the steps of the quarterback right because if quarterback drops back three steps that's a short pass because you have to get in rhythm and your drop has to time up with the route if he drops back five then you have an intermediate so we know that those are like bang eights or digs if you drop back seven you're dropping back seven to time up to throw a deep route so when he sees that he's looking at the receiver and looking at the quarterback at the same time because he can see it in his peripheral and then he's just playing one route but, but what, why did Revis have to get involved with that because this goes back to 2012 right so he's been waiting for opportunity when Shermer came in Sherman I don't know why I keep calling him Shermer Sherman came in Revis was the top dog and Sherman wanted to be recognized so he said that he was the best so he called Revis out so this goes back to 2012 so Revis has been saying bro you're a system guy you're not a guy that can say it's a, listen it's a whole different category for guys that can say listen you're my man and you ain't going nowhere I don't care if you're in the backfield Revis like Bill Belichick used to try to hide his receivers in the backfield to bring Revis in the box so he can get his guys away from Revis right so they were running their deep routes or their digs from the backfield that's how dominant Revis was. You can say the same about Patrick Peterson. You can say the same thing about Deion Sanders. You can say the same thing about Champ Bailey. When I see Richard Sherman, I see Rondé Barber, right? I see maybe Namdi. I see a guy that's great at playing a technique, but I don't see a guy that's a guy that says, listen, I don't care. You got, you got five, eight routes that you can run in a route tree. I'm stopping them all. And listen, I don't want no help. I don't care about no safety. I don't care about no leverage. Wherever you go, that's the hardest thing to do. And you pay more for that. And it's a different section in the Hall of Fame for players that were able to do that. The Mel Blunts, the Deion Sanders, the Daryl Greens, the Aeneas Williams. It's a different category from that. All right, give us something for Rex. Uh, Rex, mm, what do you want to know? What do you want to know about Rex? No, you, we want to ask him something that we want to seem smart. He's going to be on right after you. Something about Rex. Something that you can seem smart. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like a, like a Super Bowl question, maybe, that makes him go, wow. wow only these only, guys a, really only a football mind would ask, right. would ask this question. Just, well, uh, he'll love if you say, hey, man, I, I heard that, uh, that the, uh, the league stole your sting package, and that's what we're going to see. We're going to see your sting package featured by the San Francisco 49ers. Love and, it. Write that down, Michael. And, I got it. That's very good. And they're plagiarizing, and they're not, they're not quoting their sources. Oh, so it's a plagiarizing question that we plagiarized. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I like that. Perfect. <laughs> Michael K. Show on 98.7 ESPN brought you by GEICO. The real value in car insurance isn't how much you save. It's also the kind of service you get. Good thing GEICO's been perfecting both for over 75 years. We cannot thank you enough for this. You have been unbelievable. Really? It's been like going to a master's class. And everybody should listen to him and Alan one to three every single Monday through Friday. My pleasure, man. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I see friend. you on Sunday. I still, I'm still invited? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You got okay. the address, right? I bring the Kool-Aid. All right, cool.